Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I see and hear you very well, so that's great. Ready for start. <laughs> so I would have six more minutes and, and we will start. I see people are joining. Do you hear me well? Mm -hmm. Very good. Do you hear us well? So Hazib says there is a problem with uh, the video. So try to, um, uh, what, what kind of problem do you have? Is it lagging? Is it, uh, when you say your video, you mean your camera or do you uh, mean it's difficult for you to see me, for example? Hazib. Okay. I think and the problem is. Oh, let Hazib answer. Yes, Hazib, go ahead. The problem is that that the camera isn't it, the but the in the camera button isn't working. If no, I have to change my phone, so you can see me. That's okay then. So you you will just keep your camera off as long as you see us. That's fine. We understand So Joy has such wonderful fish on her background. <laughs> floating. Anthony, we need to come up with some background for Fermi paradox for you. <laughs> Andre equation. Lots of active planets. Civilization jumping from one to another. Hey, Vasi. Senior mixing ball. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I see some of your students here. And now I get to more wisely. I'll ask students woke up earlier than others. <laughs> hey, Rebia. Hello. Hi, Julia. How are you? Good, good. So glad to see you here. We're doing good. I see several of your students here as well. Yeah, <laughs> all of them were after me throughout the week that, you know, share details with us. We are looking forward to it. I'm so glad. <laughs> and the ship is here too, just joining. Hi, 
will give people a couple of more minutes. This is the first time everyone is using this link. Hi, Gina. Hi, Queen. Hi, Kai. We have lots of people from all over the globe. I'll give people one minute. Because everyone would need to adjust their settings. But good. We're getting lots of participants here. Hello, hello, hello. We're just giving people most. So while we are waiting for everyone else, I would like to say thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Julia Bronski. Uh, I will have with some issues if you have them, but I'm not running. So, right? I would like to introduce you to our very first pilot program at Blue Market Space Institute of Science called Astrobiology Studies for Kids, ASK in short. Now you know what you should do, right? So, in this program, older students share their favorite topics in astrobiology with younger students. And of course, learning is all about asking questions and making mistakes. So welcome into our question asking and mistakes making program. With that, I would like to introduce our very first lecturers, Joy and Anthony. Oh. Hi, you want to give them more time or should we start? I think we can start and uh, people will join as they can. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, like she said, my name is Joy. My partner is Anthony. Um, let me share my screen. Get this all set up. Okay. So I'm going to need you guys to do something for me. Once it gets loaded. All right, so if you guys 
could go on to a new browser tab or maybe um, on your cell phone separately, go to joinpd.com. And then when you get there, type in this code that's on my screen. And let me know if you have any trouble with that. You may want to put the link in chat, Joy, as well. Okie dokie. Um, so people would be able just to click on the link. Let's see here, joinpd.com. And then the passcode, it's FNDWAT. So this is gonna allow you guys to answer the questions on the slides. It'll let us be a little bit more interactive. Looks like seven of you have connected, so that's awesome. Okay, cool, you guys. Eight people, that's good. Okay, and you guys can always join once I've started as well. That passcode stays in the upper right corner. Uh, you may need to uh, close the full screen view in Zoom in order to get to your browser. Yeah, if you guys are having trouble, just let me know. Put it in the chat or something. But it looks like I've got a handful of you on so far. Okay. So you guys, welcome, like she was saying, to Astrobiology Science for Kids. Again, my name is Joy, and my partner today is Anthony. And our agenda for today, the things that we're going to be learning about. Um, first, I'm going to talk to you guys about, just give you an introduction to what astrobiology is and the history behind astrobiology. Like how did this even become a field of science? And then Anthony is going to talk to you guys today about what's called the Fermi paradox and a very interesting question, what is life? So that is what we have got on our agenda for today. Hold on, I got one question in the chat, so let me... Yes. All right, guys. Okay, so let's get started. So first off, I want to do a quick little warm up. Um, hopefully you guys have already signed up for Padlet. If not, no worries. I'm going to put this link. Oops. It'll let me. In the chat. Hold on one second. Kai says, I used to spend like an hour a day debating paradoxes with myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is so wonderful, Kai. And that is actually where science starts, like debating in our heads, giving ideas. So that's a really cool exercise to do. All right, so if you guys wanna to go to that link I put in the chat. So what we're gonna do, it's going to give you, there's a prompt and it says, I just wanna know, like, I wanna get a feeling of what you know about astrobiology already. So just tell me a little bit about what you think astrobiology is. And then why did you sign up for this course? What, what makes you interested in astrobiology? 
And then let me switch over to, oh, it says server not found. Okay, give me one second, guys. And all these All right, give that one a try. You need to click on the plus sign to add your answer. Uh, Rabia, do you know if uh, Padlet is working uh, in your country? Because Hasid says the server is not found. Could you please check? It could have been a bad link that I gave them. Oh, OK, now working. OK, thank you, Arna. Okay, cool. So yeah, sorry I gave you the first, uh, the wrong link. So Queen, the way to answer is to click on the plus sign at the yeah. um, right low corner. Yeah, so down here on my screen, you've got a plus sign that turns into a pencil. So there's different ways for you to answer the question in Padlet. Um, it's pretty cool. You can do like a, you could record yourself a video recording, you could record yourself on the camera. Um, you could draw something, you could put in links or pictures and GIFs. You could just type out your answer if you want. So it's really versatile. It lets you answer in um, lots of different ways. I wonder how you could draw an astrobiology. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> This is a good one, Michael. If a person that is always right says he's always wrong, is the right or wrong? <laughs> All right, so let's see. And there are no wrong answers, you guys. So don't worry about that. All right, looks like we're getting some <laughs> munch munch. Okay. So are there anyone that wants to read their response? Or are we, is it too early in the morning? Or maybe it's maybe it's the afternoon for some of you guys. Too early, definitely. Too early, okay. So I can, I can read some of these. All right, so it looks like you guys are on the right track. So astrobiology is the study of life in space. That's awesome. Let's see, these things keep popping, moving around, so it's hard to, hard to catch it. Astrobiology, is exploring life and what life might become. I signed up for this course because it was, and they're still typing. Um, astrobiology is a scientific field that studies early evolution and the future of life. These are really great responses. Let's see here, this one looks like it's finished. So astrobiology is the study of life in space and what is needed for life. In Greek, astro means space, bio, life, and ology to study. So I signed up for this because I always love science in space. So I wanted to learn more. Awesome, guys. Let's see, astrobiology is exploring life and what life is might become. I signed up for this course because it was a good opportunity to continue astrobiology through the summer. It looks like we've got some cool pictures here. Earth. <laughs> 
And then, um, let's see, I started this course because I have been reading about astronomy and astrobiology since I was a kid. So I just wanna say that I think it's truly awesome that you guys are already so inspired and passionate about space and astrobiology. You guys are way cooler than I was at your age. Let's see here. In Latin, astro means space and biology means the study of life. So astrobiology means the study of life in space. I signed up because I did a lot of Julia's courses and loved them. Awesome job, you guys. I think everyone's responded who's here. And you guys are all exactly on the right track. You have nailed it. Okay, so let me figure out how to get back to my presentation. Okay, awesome job you guys. So thank you for that. Everyone is definitely really obviously excited about astrobiology and learning more about it. And that is what is going to happen this summer. We're gonna learn all about the different aspects of all the different theories that go along with the origin of life and what else is out there in the universe. All right, so um, a lot of you guys already talked about this. So um, I am a science teacher and I like to, when we get to certain words, um, I always tell my students, if you're not sure what it means, break down the word. So astrobiology is pretty easy to break down because it is composed of the word astro and biology. Okay, astro just means anything that's relating to the stars, um, celestial objects, which are gonna be things like the moons, um, comets, um, and then, or anything that deals with outer space. And then biology is just the study of life. So when you put those two together, we're looking at um, the study of life as it pertains to space. So NASA's um, definition of astrobiology is the study of the origins, the evolution, the distribution, and the future of life in the universe. And NASA has made it their mission to try to answer these three important questions, okay? How does life begin and evolve? So there's going to be a team of researchers right now that are trying to figure out how did life begin on Earth? Because right now, in order to create life, you need life. So at some point in time, there was something going on with uh, molecules and chemicals that had to have come together to create molecules that are capable of forming life. So that's a very um, hot topic right now in research in astrobiology is how did we become, how did we get here? The next question that they're interested in is, well, is there life beyond earth and how can we detect it? So, the hard part is figuring out, looking out at the night sky, you just see some stars. How, are, how is it that we're going to figure out if there's life on these planets and things out there um, when they're so far away? How do, we de how do we figure out, what do we look for um, if there is life on these other planets or moons and things like that? So that's a, a question that they're trying to answer right now as well. And then the third one is, well, what is the future of life on Earth and in the universe? Okay, so it deals with um, space exploration. Should we, should we be doing these missions to Mars and um, other moons that might have habitable zones and 
perhaps might have life on there. So there's lots of ethical questions that go into, should we be doing this? Um, so those are the three main questions that NASA is working on as it um, deals with astrobiology. Okay, so if you are able to, if you were able to get on to um, join PD and, and input the code, at the bottom right of your screen, it will ask you to um, click on it so you can answer this question. And it is, which of those three questions are you most interested in answering? Are you most interested in answering, um, figuring out our origin? Or are you interested in finding out if there's life in outer space? Are you interested in figuring out what is our, the future on Earth? Should we be um, doing all of these explorations to try and find life out there? So let's see. So far, we've got four, people are changing their minds. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> I was listening for a number B. B. Okay. So let's see. So most people actually are more interested in what is the future of life on Earth and in the universe. So we're really interested in you guys are mostly interested in it looks like space exploration. Um, what is our future here? And um, you know, where is our place in the universe? And then three of you looks like are most interested in, is there life beyond Earth and how can we detect it? I know my, for me personally, I'm definitely most interested in, and this is why I always have been passionate about astrobiology, is actually trying to find, is there life out in our universe? All right, so it looks like you guys keep changing your answers. So now it's four of you that are interested in Yay. life beyond Earth. Yeah, you guys can change your answers. Um, and then what is the future of life on Earth is the second. So it's most, most of you guys are not too interested in how did life begin and evolve. All right, you guys, cool. So let's move on. Um, blank slide. Yeah, it's a quick, quick little video, you guys. Hopefully, this isn't too laggy. If it is, we'll just skip it. Hold on one second. When you share your, your screen, you could uh, click optimize for video clip. That should be a little bit better because it really is. Like yeah, for some reason, though, the option here, I'm going to get out of this for a second and go into this so that I can properly do all of that. First, join the 321 science team as we explore astrobiology. It's studying life wherever and whatever it may be. The study of life in the universe explores some of the most profound questions humans can ask. How does life evolve here on Earth? What is life? Are we alone? How will we know when we see it? Humans have been asking these questions for ages. Philosophers, scientists, theologians, artists, all try to answer these questions. For example, science fiction has explored these questions by portraying extraterrestrial life in the form of deeply cultured, intelligent civilizations. Scientists explore these questions as they study the life forms here on Earth and as they look beyond Earth 
to seek occurrences of life on other moons and planets. Of course, so far, we only have one example of life, life here on Earth. Although there are many types of life on Earth, we are all biochemically linked. But perhaps our explorations will find life elsewhere in our solar system, or in other solar systems around distant stars. Will we recognize it when we encounter it? It will probably be very different. The chemistry of life may be universal, but it may not be. It helps in the quest for life to look for precursors or markers of life as we know it. To understand our own origins, we look for signs of water, organic molecules, and sources of energy on planets, moons, and meteorites. To investigate the astrobiology of our own origins, we send probes to look for clues on small bodies in the solar system. The OSIRIS-REx mission will explore the asteroid Bennu, a carbon-rich asteroid that scientists expect to hold organic molecules and other molecular building blocks necessary for life on Earth. Scientists will study the return sample to reveal what molecules exist in these ancient asteroids and if they could be the source of organics and water that were foundations for life in the solar system, and particularly here on Earth. To learn more about astrobiology, Bennu, and OSIRIS-REx, click on the links. This video is an OSIRIS-REx Alright, so let me get back out of this. We have some wonderful discussion going on in chat. <laughs> <laughs> also talking, asking about silicon-based life, right? Some wise piece, please wow. answer that. What is it exactly you want to know about this silicon-based life? Yeah, it's hard for me to see the chat right now. So it's good that you guys are letting me know. Instead of right now, life on Earth is carbon based. And I think the theory behind it is that it's possible for some organisms to perhaps be um, silicone based. So the question is, how does silicon replace carbon in the organic molecules? For those of you who are studying uh, microbiology and chemistry, device piece. And Brenna also asks whether water is actually needed for non-Earth life. Maybe we can use some other type of liquid. I think right now at with how astrobiologists are looking at tackling this problem is that for the most part we are using what do what does life on earth need okay we need energy we need water um, we have certain molecules that we come together to form us and we take all of that and we look for those things out in space so we know we need water. Everything on life needs water. So we're thinking that other organisms out in space would also need water. So it would be hard to figure out what other types of liquids they could need since everything on life on Earth needs those, those water molecules. So I think this question partially arised from our findings on Titan that may have liquid methane instead of water. So like a question about cryogenic life. Mm -hmm. May there be some other life that is using some other types of liquids at different temperatures, for example. 
Yeah. But of course, water is very abundant in space. So mm -hmm. it seems like a natural choice. Yeah, it's just we need a starting place. So the, the easiest thing was to look for the molecules that we know life needs on Earth out, look for those things out in space. But as um, time goes on, I would imagine they'd start branching out and looking, okay, well, can we look for things that might be, like you were saying, silicone based or looking at liquid methane. Um, it's still such a new field and we're, there's still so many unanswered questions. Okay, so let's quickly just, um, Real quick, you guys, um, what I really wanted to make sure that um, I got some time to talk to you about was it's awesome that you guys are interested and passionate about astrobiology, but I want you to show you how you can become an astrobiologist. So if you're really into astronomy and space, you know, forever, people were always thinking, okay, the only thing I can do is to become an astronomer or go into physics. And actually now it's, there's all of these different ways to become an astrobiologist. So um, you can, there's like a huge list here of all the different ways, pathways that you can take in order to become one. So if you wanted to, if you know, get a, these are, you know, degrees if you were in college, study biology, of course, astronomy, but things like chemistry, um, microbiology, oceanography, these all really play a huge role in astrobiology, okay? Part of astrobiology, you need to understand how life works. Um, if you want to find life in outer space, you need to understand how life works on Earth. So that's really why it's great to get a biology degree or even something like a microbiology degree so that you can really understand how life works and how to look for it out in space. Um, if you're interested in the origin of life, chemistry would be a really great route for you. Um, oceanography is really great too because there's that theory that life started in the hydrothermal vents at the very bottom of the ocean. So you would wanna get an oceanography degree if you're interested in hydrothermal vents. Um, but there's other ways too, you know, um, for example, botany, if you're into plants, you could help um, figure out how to help astronauts um, grow their own vegetables and things like that in space. And then there's things that you probably wouldn't have thought of. If you're into art, um, lots of, you'll see later on, but there's lots of people right now that are really very artistic and paint and do graphic design and things like that to promote astrobiology. And then things like psychology and law. Well, once we start doing more space exploration, we're going to need um, psychologists and we're going to need to figure out new laws for space exploration. So there's lots of different ways to become an astrobiologist. And um, I will put in the chat in a second here. Let's see, I've got some questions popping up. Um, if you go to this website, and I'll put it in the chat, this is a link on NASA's website. And it is for, um, I think it was fifth to eighth graders. And it talks about careers in um, NASA, careers, different um, astrobiology pathways. So it's something that you might wanna look into and start thinking about which pathway do you wanna take? Which one are you most interested in, in being able to become an astrobiologist? Yep, like Julia is saying, international and space law. And engineers are going to be important because we need to make spaceships that are able to go a long distance. And you guys have to figure out too, 
how to put humans to sleep for like 200 years. There's lots of, lots of new things that need, we need engineers for. Okay, so here is our second question. What path to becoming an astrobiologist um, are you most interested in? So go ahead and answer the question on the bottom right. Click that button. Oops, let me get rid of this. And let's look at some responses. So, so far we've got a chemist, planetary science, astronomy, ooh, art, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, geology is really important too for understanding the origin of life. Everyone's <laughs> just not too decided yet. We're flipping around here. Microbiology, biotechnology. Let me check the chat really fast. <laughs> too many to choose from, right guys? Well, I, I can tell you, I went and personally, I have a biology degree um, so that I, I, if I wanted to, I could use that and um, towards astrobiology, but I'm actually really thinking about going back to school and maybe getting a PhD in planetary sciences because now I've become really fascinated with atmospheres of other planets and I want to look in their atmospheres and see, do they have any signs, um, what they're called biosignatures. You guys probably already know about them because you're really smart, but we will learn more about them later on. But um, I want to look at atmospheres and see um, if we can detect any kind of molecules or things that are kind of known for hosting life. Let me check the chat really fast. All right, again, if you guys um, are just logging in, if you, um, yeah, thank you, Brianna. I was gonna put it in there. So if you go to that link, if you're just logging in, go to that link um, and you should be able to answer our questions as we go along. Okay, so let's see our final tally probably. So I think most, most of you guys are really interested in chemistry and that's awesome because that's really going to help you um, with the origin of life. You really, really need to understand how the chemicals work. How did they come together um, so that they could create a molecule that is a molecule that is able to create life, come together and create life. So that is a really big topic right now. All right, and so I just wanted to show you guys too what an astrobiologist looks like and what do they actually do? So I just, if you, um, down here there is a podcast it's called Ask an Astrobiologist. So um, they have a, a site, they interview different astrobiologists. It's really cool and you guys should check it out. But I just picked three of them from that. Um, so for example, um, Batul uh, Kakar, she is a, an assistant professor of astrobiology at the University of Arizona. So she directs NASA astrobiology research. Um, she, they're exploring the essential attributes of life, its origins, and how they should shape our notions of hab habit. I can't say this word habitability and the research for life on other world, other worlds. So she's really interested in the origin of life and figuring out what makes certain planets habitable and lo looking for life out on those planets or worlds. They could be moons too, you never know, right? Um, Aaron Gronstall, so 
he first started working for NASA as a geomicrobiologist, but he got also really interested because um, he is an artist as well. He now is doing comic books based on astrobiology. So if you want to look up this guy, he's got a whole series of astrobiology comic books. And then Lucianne um, Wolkowicz, she is an astronomer. She works at the Adler Planetarium, um, which is noted for research that contributes to what's called stellar magnetic activity and its impact on planetary suitability for extraterrestrial life. She also, if you go to the Ask an Astrobiology podcast, she is talking about um, the ethics of astrobiology. Should we, if we find life, let's say, let, you know how we're doing all these um, missions to Mars right now, we have that new rover, the Perseverance, collecting samples. Well, what if they do find something? should we just leave it alone and leave? Or should we continue to stay and analyze and interact with the life? So there's a lot of ethical questions that revolve around um, looking for life out on other planets and moons. Should we be doing these things? So that's what her um, podcast interview is about, the ethics of astrobiology. All right, so the next one is, do you want to be an astrobiologist? Or are you just interested in the topic? Um, if you are, please explain why. All right, so we've got some answers coming in. <laughs> yes, it pays the bills. Those are so funny. Let's see, is anybody else still on here? Let's see, I'm hoping to become a neurosurgeon when I get older. But I think astrobiology is amazing and I hope to learn for years to come. So that's really great that I, I am just very proud of you guys for broadening your horizons and just getting into courses about things that you're interested about. Let's see, I think I will instead go to NASA for mechanical engineering. Rockets is my thing plus radio. Radio can definitely be used in astrobiology. Just yeah. think about SETI, right? Yeah. So you guys, when I was your age, my dream job was to work at SETI so that I could try and find um, a signal from space. Let's see. What else do we have here? I don't know if I'm going to become a hardcore astrobiologist, but I like the topic, especially talking about aliens and astronomy. Yes. Let's see, did I miss some things? I am interested because it feels fun learning about space and whether we are alone in the universe. I'm not sure if I want to become an astrobiologist. It is something I am really interested in, but I feel like I'd rather study something like quantum chemistry or more advanced calculus. <laughs> You guys are so much smarter than me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Quantum chemistry, that's awesome. Let's see here. When I grow up, I think I actually may want to become an astrobiologist. I want to because I love Julia's classes and they inspire me. 
I do enjoy learning astrobiology a lot, but I am not exactly sure what I would like to do when I grow up yet. And that is 100% perfectly normal. There are just so many options. I am surely going to be a astrobiologist as a hardware engineer to design a camera that will sense heat and signs of life. That's awesome, you guys. Looks like this one is almost done. I definitely want to be around the topic. I am considering being a planetary scientist. I actually don't like rocket science, but I love astronomy and chemistry. I also love exploding things. Um, AKA I just love hands-on things. So maybe I can work in a lab, definitely. There's lots of, so anyone wants to be um, astrobiology educator, someone wants to do calculus, <laughs> munch munch again, <laughs> and someone has not chosen yet either. All right, well, I'm glad you guys are thinking about it already. All right, so quickly, I just wanted to get into the history of astrobiology because um, once upon a time, if an astronomer mentioned that they were interested or thought that that might be life on uh, in the universe, they were actually laughed at. They were not taken seriously. And it's actually been pretty recent that talking about life outside of Earth has become very common and accepted. So astrobiology is, is actually a fairly new subject for astronomy. It's gained a lot of popularity thanks to the missions to Mars and from data that we're getting from the Galileo space probe that is actually showing right now strong evidence of liquid water under its icy surface of Europa. But really, since the dawn of mankind, right, we've been looking to the stars for answers. How did we get here? Are we alone in the universe? So really, since the beginning of our time, we've been asking these questions. All right, so philosophers and poets. So they actually the first recorded person that they know about to have thoughts and talk about extraterrestrial intelligence was this Greek philosopher named Ipicarus. Ip so that is this guy right here. Um, and then we have this um, guy, he is a Roman poet named uh, Lucretius. He wrote a poem titled De Rerum Natura that discusses other worlds. And then a little bit later, we have Christian Huygens. He speculated life to exist on the moon as well as Jupiter. Now, I just wanna point out you guys, during this time period, it was really controversial to talk about um, these types of things, life outside of earth, because it, it went against their religion. So it was, very um, risky for them to publish anything or even talk about these topics. All right, sometime later, what was interesting that I found was that Darwin never published this, but in a letter to a friend in 1871, he proposed to his friend in the letter that life began not in the open ocean, but in a smaller body of water on land. And it had to have been really rich in chemicals. So this is actually the very beginning of the primordial soup idea that we'll learn more about later. So basically what's happening is in a pool, right? Not a very large body of water, um, you're going to have a lot of chemicals, okay? They're very, it's gonna be very concentrated. And when the water evaporates in the heat of the day, um, some chemical reactions can occur. So he hypothesized that the initial synthesis of the chemicals of life would be powered by the combination of light, 
heat and chemical energy. So this was really the first time that anyone has talked about what is actually needed to create life. Um, at this time, Darwin, I mean, had the DNA had not even been discovered yet. So we were a long way from being able to do any kind of experiments to test his, his hypothesis, but it, it had been put out there. So um, in 1920, what's interesting was you have a Russian scientist um, operant, and then there was an English scientist, last name his, is Haldane, okay? So what was interesting was that these guys both came to the same hypothesis about the origin of life, but they didn't work together at all. So because they came to this, uh, the idea of the same hypothesis at the same time, we call it the operant Haldane hypothesis. And what it is, is that they believe that life on Earth could have arisen in a step-by-step, -step, okay, forming from you start with non-living matter and through a process of step-by-step -step chemical, gradual chemical evolution steps, you end up with molecules that are biological, okay? So it's kind of like if you have... Think about it in terms of Legos, right? You have individual Legos. And once you start putting these Legos together, you get these more complex structures that now are able to be, have become biological. They could be a protein. They could be um, maybe a nucleic acid from DNA or something like that. So that was the theory Opper and Haldane first proposed that the formation of life starts with um, non-living matter. There's a series of steps that happen. And at the end, you have a biological molecule. All right, so this one, you guys, is my favorite experiment of all time. This is what made me want to get into astrobiology. It's called the Miller-Urey experiment. All right, so in 1953, you have a man named Stanley Miller and Harold Yergey. They were finally able to, at this point, they had the technology to actually do an experiment on um, Operin and Haldane's theory. So what they did was they built this apparatus here. Okay, so this is a closed system. Nothing comes in, nothing leaves. So they start by heating a pool of water. So something similar that you would find on Earth, some, a pool of water perhaps near um, a volcano or something that has a lot of heat. Um, they, so that um, water gets vaporized, right? It turns into steam and it goes up through the apparatus. And then they were like, okay, well, we need to simulate lightning because that's going to be our source of energy. So they put a spark through the apparatus, okay? They also included molecules that they knew were prevalent on early Earth, things like methane and ammonia and hydrogen gas. And of course, we have our water vapor. So they put the spark through it. And what ended up happening was something very interesting. So they let the experiment run for a week. All right. And at the bottom, you see down here how it's brown. What they found was when they did and they analyzed this brown stuff that they got, and there was actually amino acids, sugars, and lipids. So these are very important molecules for life. Um, they didn't find things like DNA, um, but it's really interesting that this experiment showed that at least some of the building blocks for these molecules could form spontaneously from compounds that they knew early Earth had. So this was really such a very interesting experiment that 
tasks showed a possible pathway to how biological molecules could have been made from non-living matter. Okay, Doki, so those were really the, the most important steps um, that really opened the door for astrobiology research. Um, the project that I'm working on um, deals with trying to figure out the Zach, we're trying to continue Miller and Urey's experiments. We're looking for chemicals for molecules that could have come together. How did they come together to form biological molecules? So that's the research I'm working on. It's like a continuation of that experiment. And let's see, today we have lots of theories about the origin of life. It's not just this one. So um, we'll learn more about this down the road, but quickly, some scientists today, they believe that it's called the RNA world hypothesis. So it suggests that first um, molecule, biological molecule to have existed was RNA, which is basically the cousin of DNA. And then this RNA molecule started to be able to do different jobs and create different other biological molecules. But some scientists think that um, it's called the metabolism first hypothesis. So they think that placing the metabolic networks, so things came before the DNA and RNA. So things happened, were made that created the DNA and the RNA. And then there's also really other cool theories too that these biological molecules actually came from meteorites that crashed onto Earth. They have done analyses that showed biological organic compounds are on meteorites. There's the, I'm sure you guys have heard also that um, perhaps life started at the hydrothermal vents or hydrothermal fields. So um, basically, we're still trying to figure it out. And that's why we need you guys, a new set, a new generation to come in and help us try and answer these questions. And, you know, maybe one of you guys will figure out how did life begin on earth? Okay, so we're gonna take a break, you guys. We'll come back, let's say, I don't know, 10 02 perhaps. So get up and stretch, get some water. Thank you so much, Joy, and thank you, all the participants. Uh, go stretch, go uh, lay down. Uh, get a drink and come back. Do some jumping jacks.
All right, so if you guys are there, let's get started. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Anthony and he's gonna talk to you guys about the Fermi paradox and what is life. So I'm gonna stop. Um, are you able to share your screen, Anthony? Yes, I am, okay. thank you. So I'm gonna start sharing. Let me see one thing right here. the chat. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. Um it's morning here, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, from every part of the world. And okay, a little introduction about myself. I'm Anthony, as Joey said, I'm 21. I'm a senior in microbiology and bioanalysis. I live in Colombia. And okay, so um, for this talk, uh, to move on with the class, I want to start with this a question for you, which is, what is the reason for you uh, for why we haven't found any type of aliens or any type of civilizations? So for that, for you to answer, I prepared this um, padlet. I'm gonna be sending you the link right now and you can answer right there. And can there be a type of five civilization made up with smart bacteria? Well, <laughs> um, that is actually a very harsh question right there. Um, is smart bacteria, well, if they are big enough, maybe. <laughs> well, smart bacteria is single celled. Yeah, exactly. So That's a problem be because hard mm -hmm. to have um, it be smart if it's just one cell big. Okay, let me check if if. <laughs> but why? Why not? Yes, there are a lot of possible reasons. So I want you to think to, I don't know, one reason, the reason that you think that is the most possible, what sounds better to you for why we haven't found any a other civilization in the universe. So maybe we can be talking about it a little bit later. And okay, um, let's wait a couple of minutes. We don't know quite what look for us. We're only used to live on to live on Earth. That's true. We also are constantly upgrading our technology, so we are having to backtrack. I feel like this is wrong, but yeah. No, no answers are wrong. Actually, there are too many possible reasons. So whatever comes to your mind is actually okay. If you want to, you can also interact with your classmates like like in their comments or maybe commenting on, on there.
it's possible that any existing civilizations might have different technology than us, so they are too difficult to reach. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move on. And okay, so first and first, uh, I want to tell you that actually you doing these type of exercises makes you already an astrobiologist. Because thinking of different forms of life and just thinking of any alternative is actually an astrobiologist work. So you being here is already a great start and being interested in these topics makes us much better. So the idea is for you to maybe grow a background on any of science fields so that you can actually in the future to be able to prove your ideas in a scientifically way. But okay, I already know that um, some of you um, maybe know about these products. And this is a very funny paradox, the Fermi paradox, which is this uh, sir that we can see on the screen, Enrico Fermi was having a lunch with his colleagues and then they were discussing about uh, unidentified flying objects and light speed travel. And they were also discussing about probabilistic arguments about uh, how many civilizations might there be out there trying to reach us. And since those uh, probabilities were actually too high, he said, okay, but where is everybody? And that's where the Fermi paradox started. And what I want to introduce you to one of those probabilistic argumentations that is actually very uh, famous, which is the Drake equation. Don't be afraid of the equation. I'm just gonna um, try to explain it. And what Frank Drake, who was the person that created this equation, he wanted to know how many civilizations uh, might there be that could be detectable. And he considered that for knowing that amount of civilizations, we had to know uh, how many of, a, of a stars can be formed every year in our own galaxy, how many of uh, the stars in that galaxy formed do actually have planets. How many of the planets uh, can be suitable for life? How many of that, those planets uh, that can be suitable for life do actually um, develop life? How many of that life can actually uh, evolve to an intelligent life? how many of that um, intelligent life could be able to communicate and for how long they would be doing this. So I brought an example, uh, Frank Drake estimated, uh, he had some numbers and he used this range. Now for the example that I'm using, I'm using uh, the minimum values that he uh, prepared and then he was saying, okay, so one star is being formed every year in our galaxy and 20% of the stars for, for that um, uh, develop planets. And one planet um, in every planetary system uh, is actually habitable. 100% of the planets develop life. 100% of those planets develop intelligent life and 10% of that intelligent life could be communicating for how long? Mm, maybe 1000 years. So using these minimum values, the minimum amount of civilizations that could be detectable um, based on the Drake's estimates would be 20. So there are 20 civilizations communicating, but where are they? Why haven't we detected them? So, um, I want to um, play a little with the numbers. So here is a little um, game for you to have an, a, for you to play with the, with this equation. So I, I already sent, uh, no, I haven't sent you the link. 
I already sent you the link so you can go there and you can play with the numbers. You just click on accept and the game actually can upload after one minute. And let me know if, if, if you could open the game. Is loading. Perfect. Yeah, it takes one minute to, to load. Which makes you wonder what it is loading. What is it loading? The, um, this game that I'm presenting, so I'm going to send the link once again. And the idea is to play with the numbers uh, of this Drake's equation that I was talking to you about. Let me know if it already loaded. Okay. You're in the game now. Okay, so if you're already in the game, you can start answering all of the questions. Uh, Anthony, you may want to do it on your screen for those people who will be able to open it. They can just make their suggestions in chat. All right. So this is a game if it's it hasn't loaded for any of you. So let's start. The first question that they're asking us it is what percent of the stars in the Milky Way have planets? Now, what do you think? And here it says you can ask a scientist, so it will give us an estimate. And maybe you could base on that. 100%, okay. Tashif says 100%, so I'm gonna use 100%. Continue. Now, how many planets per star do you think that are habitable? Let's use zero, any number could work. So 0 0.5. On what percent of habitable planets does life evolve? On what percent of habitable planets does life evolve? I would say 100%. <laughs> The next question would be, on what percent of planets with life does intelligent life evolve? So we, we could use any estimates in here. Frank Drake used to say 1%, so 1%, exactly. How long does intelligent life survive on a planet? So, this uh, is a guess, so I'm, I'm going to guess 10,000 years, let's say, for being optimistic. Now, if you could play the game with every different option, it would give a different number of civilizations that there could be. So in here it says, based on the factors that I selected, there could have been 1 billion intelligent communicating civilizations in all the history of the Milky Way galaxy. But these civilizations don't last forever, so there might be 1,000 civilizations overlapping with us. But against, we have this question. So if there are 1,000 civilizations, where is everybody? Um, this is another, um, here you can put a, the numbers of um, that you would, that you think that would be um, the actual probabilities. Um, and then you can use it with any of the estimates. But 
but okay, let's continue. And for you to have a better, a graphic idea of what I'm talking about, like, okay, where is everybody? The universe is so vast. If there are so many planets, so many stars, so many galaxies, then where is everybody? So here we have a video for that, for have a better idea. Are we the only living things in the entire universe? The observable universe. Can you turn it up a little bit? Sorry about this. This has Spanish subtitles. <laughs> Since I'm in Colombia, the that is automatic. Sorry. The entire video is in Can you listen to the video? It's a little low. Uh, you need to click share computer sound on your screen, Antonia. Oh, sorry. In the options. Otherwise, we won't be able to. Oh. We the only better. Yeah. Much better. Thank you. The living things in the entire universe. The observable universe is about 90 billion light years in diameter. There are at least 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 to 1,000 billion stars. Recently, we've learned that planets are very common too. And there are probably trillions and trillions of habitable planets in the universe, which means there should be lots of opportunity for life to develop and exist, right? But where is it? Shouldn't the universe be teeming with spaceships? Let's take a step back. Even if there are alien civilizations in other galaxies, there's no way we'll ever know about them. Basically, everything outside of our direct galactic neighborhood, the so-called local group, is pretty much out of our reach forever because of the expansion of the universe. Even if we had really fast spaceships, it would literally take billions of years to reach these places, traveling through the emptiest areas in the universe. So let's focus on the Milky Way. The Milky Way is our home galaxy. It consists of up to 400 billion stars. That's a lot of stars. Counting one per second, it would take you a hundred lifetimes to count them all. There are about 20 billion sun-like stars in the Milky Way, and estimates suggest that a fifth of them have an Earth-sized planet in its habitable zone, the area with conditions that enable life to exist. If only 0.1% of those planets harbored life, there would be one million planets with life in the Milky Way. But wait, there's more. The Milky Way is about 13 billion years old. In the beginning, it would not have been a good place for life because things exploded a lot. But after one to two billion years, the first habitable planets were born. Earth is only four billion years old, so there have probably been trillions of chances for life to develop on other planets in the past. If only a single one of them had developed into a space-traveling super-civilization, we would have noticed by now. What would such a civilization look like? There are three categories. A Type 1 civilization would be able to access the whole energy available on its planet. In case you're wondering, we're currently around 0.73 on the scale, and we should reach Type 1 sometime in the next couple of hundred years. Type 2 would be a civilization capable of harnessing all of the energy of its home star. This would require some serious science fiction, but it is doable in principle. Concepts like the Dyson Sphere, a giant complex surrounding the Sun, would be conceivable. Type 3 is a civilization that basically controls its whole galaxy and its energy. An alien race this advanced would probably be godlike to us. But why should we be able to see such an alien civilization in the first place? If we were to build generation spaceships that could sustain a population for around 1,000 years, we could colonize the whole galaxy in 2 million years. Sounds like a long time, but remember, the Milky Way is huge. So if it takes a couple of million years to colonize the entire galaxy, and there are possibly millions, if not billions, of planets that sustain life in the Milky Way, and these other life forms have had considerably more time than we've had, then where are all the aliens? This is the Fermi Paradox, and nobody has an answer to it. But okay, so that <laughs> was the part of the video that... Are we that I wanted to share. So for now, do you have any question about the Fermi or ideas or comments about the Fermi paradox or the Drake equation? 
<laughs> I'm guessing even if they could contact us, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I mean, uh, if they could contact us, because the Drake equation only tells us they could, they might not want to or not even uh, suspect that there is, there is anybody else out there, right? And besides, like, there are, like, <laughs> there, there's a lot of different frequencies, so, and we probably wouldn't even recognize them when we see it. And uh, we have to be pointing in just at the right place, just at the right star. And uh, yeah, pretty much it's probably, yeah, and there are balloons that they can talk to each other. And that's probably where we might see them. A little bit unlikely at <laughs> this point, but might be one. Okay. Very much so. Yes, definitely. All I can say is that we need to build a Dyson sphere. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe for sure. How would they even contact us? That's actually a very interesting question. Maybe are they advanced enough? I bet extraterrestrial life is looking for us too. It could be. There is actually another paradox about that, which is called the SETI paradox. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about it later. What if tomorrow 10 ships come and they have aliens in it? That would be funny. <laughs> what if they don't want to? Wormholes could make travel possible. That's a very interesting uh, discussion to have, and you will hear about it later in these sessions. What if they're hiding from us? That is actually a very possible explanation. Now, talking about this paradox, um, there are so many uh, different hypothetical solutions uh, for this paradox. They are a lot, so I'm not going to be talking about all of them, but they can be grouped. So the first um, group, let's say, is that intelligent life or life just as well is extremely rare. That's a um, very weird casualty in the universe. So maybe we're like, this little flower in the middle of the of of a desert so we are very unique possibly there is another explanation that is related to evolution of the civilizations the first one would be that they don't have the advanced technology as we do but uh, another one could be that maybe it is nature for civilizations to destroy themselves or to destroy other civilizations. Another uh, way is that maybe societies, um, other societies are too different from ours. For example, they don't want to conquer the whole galaxy. So they decide to settle just in some parts of the um, galaxy or even just conquering other planets or other places in the universe is just not a norm. They don't think it would be useful, so they just don't do it. Another problem is that maybe resources are just not enough. It is too difficult to be traveling all over the universe, so it is much easier to keep emitting signals and try to uh, find life that way. In or maybe just discovering extraterrestrial life is not as easy as we might think. So maybe we're not listening appropriately. We don't know what to focus on. We are not, um, we, maybe that's just too difficult or they are too fast. Like somebody was saying that we just cannot reach them or they can reach us. And also, like I was telling you before, there is a, another paradox, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence paradox. And it says that maybe everyone is listening, 
but no one is emitting any signals. So if everybody is listening, but nobody is speaking, then we are not going to contact them at all. Another solution would be that life is just not willing to communicate since they could be hiding from us or they could be experimenting with us like they know about us but they just don't want to interact with us so for now do you have any questions or any comments on this what do you think um that could be another solution for these products does any of your answers in the palette actually is close to any of those hypothetical solutions. Someone is there to hear it, but a tree doesn't fall in a forest. Is the person there? That's an interesting question. What if the aliens are four dimensional? They could be in another dimension, <laughs> definitely. And we just don't imagine that. So we are not able to even understand that type, that form of life. And also there is a hypothetical solution that says that we are like fishes in a fish